What is going on, guys? Matt coming at you today with a special edition episode. Now, uh, recently, we added a new feature into our Warriors Tribe membership, and it's really sweet. What we've been doing is bringing experts in and interviewing them live in front of our members, and they get the chance to do Q&As. And so what I wanted to do is share with you guys one of the episodes we did recently with a nutritionist who is also living with type 1 diabetes and is in school to become a physician assistant. So hop in, get a small glimpse of what's going on in the Warriors Tribe, and I'll give you guys uh, a special invite towards the end of this episode to join the fun as well. So I hope you guys enjoy, and we'll cue the theme song. I've spent the last 10 years pushing the limits while identifying trends and patterns in my type 1 diabetes management. Follow along as I learn, apply, and share the fitness, nutrition, and lifestyle strategies that I've learned from diabetes experts around the world. The real question is, how can we live fearlessly with diabetes while maintaining stable blood sugars? This podcast is here to give you the answer. My name is Matt Vandervecht, and with my co-host, Ali abdul Karim, we welcome you to Pardon My Pancreas. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Pardon My Pancreas podcast. I feel like I haven't said that in a long time. It's been too long since we've had a live episode. Uh, but today, I have a really exciting guest on with me, and that is a nutritionist, a physician assistant student, and a type 1 diabetic, Taylor Gann. Is it Gann or Gone? Gan. Gan. Okay, cool. Taylor Gan, <laughs> welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, I actually was on the swim team in high school, and so they actually started calling me Taylor Gone because she would be whoo, gone. But, <laughs> yeah, that, that didn't quite stick as I got older. Oh, that's amazing, though. So you were known for being an amazing athlete then, right? You're just like oh. one of the fastest people. Yeah, I was a good athlete. Amazing is, is a little too, <laughs> too, uh, blisterous i guess oh that's too yeah. funny okay well actually i'm curious about your backstory now since you were a swimmer in high school but can you tell us a little bit about your life growing up with type 1 diabetes and how that all sure. started yeah so i'm actually a late bloomer i was diagnosed at 17. Um, at this point i had given up swimming competitively so i wasn't an athlete at the time um, but was healthy, you know, fit, active. I think a pretty textbook story. Nobody in the family had diabetes. All of a sudden, I got really sick and cut to I'm at the hospital, um, you know, for DKA and, and was treated. And there starts, you know, diabetes. Yeah. So within the diabetes diagnosis, was that, uh, I don't know how to explain this. My experience was terrible. Did you have a better experience than me where they gave you all the tools you needed, the education, or was it just like, good luck? Well, I was, like I said, I was 17, so I was technically a pediatric patient, and so I did. I got a whole week long of here's how you dose insulin, here's mm -hmm. how you check your blood sugar, here's how you deal with sick days and emergency visits. Um, so they really took the time to break it down, uh, get me kind of on my feet in that survival mode. Uh, for the first few months. But once I turned 18, nope, it was like, oh, cool, you have a sliding scale and you have your, your Atlantis dosing, you have what you need. Cool, we'll see you in six months. Yeah, um, oh, okay, you're young, you know how to use the computer, you don't really need nutrition consults. Um, so yes, I, I totally get, I've seen like both uh, ends of the spectrum of getting really intensive care versus, okay, you're free, go and figure out diabetes, you know. Hmm. Yeah, I totally forgot about the pediatric diagnosis versus adult, which I was at 19 when I got diagnosed. And it was yeah. totally just a good luck. Here is half of the insulin you're supposed to have. And we don't really know what to tell you. So, you know, it's just a nightmare. But I've heard right. very different stories with the week long education if you're diagnosed before 18. So very happy to hear that you had that. Uh, even though it sucks to be diagnosed, like, right. you know, if you could wait an extra year or two, would it be worth it? Probably, but <laughs> you still had like the smooth entrance, you know, so. Right. Yeah. Well, okay. So did that, that influence your career choice at all or any paths you took thereafter? Absolutely. So I guess I was a senior in high school, it was like a week before senior prom and we had all of our college applications out, you know, I can remember that time very vividly. And um, I, I went into school undeclared. I went uh, down in Southern California to Cal Poly Pomona and I was accepted as an undeclared major. 
no idea what I wanted to do. I thought maybe psych at the time, I thought I'd go and be a teacher. Um, and then I met my registered dietitian and my diabetes educator in, in the hospital. And I told my mom, I think this is what I should go on to do, you know, and, and that kind of planted the seed. It wasn't like right then and there at diagnosis, you know, the, the clear picture came and, and revealed itself to me. But uh, I always tell people, even now as a student, I would not be what I'm doing today if I would have never had diabetes. And so in a weird way, diabetes is the best thing that ever happened to me. Isn't that weird? It's like yes. ironic how this terrible disease that wrecks your life plans but then you realize it didn't wreck your life plans, it redirected them. Right. And it Absolutely. brought you into a place where you can thrive and it's just this incredible opportunity. Right, yeah, yeah. And everybody, I always get to, oh, but you're so young and oh, you have <laughs> diabetes, you know, cause I, I definitely bring it up a lot, especially with um, patients because, mm -hmm. you know, they look at me and they're like, you're a young skinny girl, you have no idea what it's like, what I have to go through and the changes I have to make. And then I say, I, well, no, yeah, I actually know so much about that. Let's talk about it. And I get the, oh no. And it's like, no, 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 don't feel sorry. Like, thank you, but it's a great thing and, and it's okay, you know? Absolutely. It's amazing that perspective shift that happens too from a patient perspective where it's like, you don't understand me, you don't know what I'm going through until they realize you do. And they're like, right. oh, okay, I guess I'll listen. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. They're like, oh, okay. Yeah, and I don't have any direct experience with that, but my sister is a type one and she is an ICU nurse. And every oh, once wow. in a while, there's a type one that comes in uh, because of DKA and they get frustrated. You don't know about insulin or what it does. You just know from textbooks. And she's like, nah, here's my insulin pump. I'm a type one diabetic too. And they're like, oh, shoot. All right. I'll take care of myself. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> I take it back. I take it back. Yeah. yeah, it's so powerful because you have the experience backing your words, which is amazing. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's always a fine balance. Um, you know, now that I've gone through the the PA school, the medical component of it, um, I do see how little we're taught about type one diabetes. And so, you know, I always see these posts on like Instagram or Facebook about um, you know, type one saying, don't confuse your medical degree with my 10, 15, however many years of uh, lifelong chronic illness type of thing. Um, and so I totally get that. But now it's kind of made me see both sides and appreciate a little bit more, see where everybody's coming from, um, and hopefully try to just bring the peace between you know, everybody. <laughs> I could get it's frustrating. But, you know, on one side, we're just trying as hard as we can as physicians. And on the other end, we're doing the same thing as type one. So it's, it's just understanding where everybody's coming from. Absolutely. And bridging that gap. That's such a powerful thing that you can do. I love that. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. So I know that you've got quite the extensive resume. Tell me a little bit about your job experience, your studies, like just list it off, show off a little bit. What's going okay. on in your life? Hey, so I have my bachelor's in nutrition science from Cal Poly Pomona um and gosh that was in 2015 so after that I came up to where I live now Hollister California for those of you who don't know it's in um northern slash central California it's a little farm agricultural town and so I've worked in different um like migrant clinics farm worker clinics throughout Hollister um I've dabbled in some work doing the same thing in Monterey County um and I worked with young kids who were at risk to develop type 2 diabetes high blood pressure um and so I've worked with young kids I've worked with you know the elderly I've worked with young moms I've kind of gotten the uh opportunity I've been very fortunate to work with the entire uh lifespan and through those uh jobs and opportunities I've had is you know, Matt, I've, I've gone to like a lot of conferences. I've earned a lot of certificates. So I'm, cer I'm a certified chronic care health coach, I think is the, I don't know, the, I can't remember the exact uh, wording. Um, I've worked as a family planning health worker. I've worked in the WIC system and I'm certified with WIC. So yes, I've done quite a bit. I'm now a graduate student and a physician assistant program. Um, so just I don't know, carrying on the torch, keep going, lifelong, <laughs> lifelong learner, I guess you could call it. Man, it's like four, five, six, I lost count on how many different <laughs> certs you have and degrees you're pursuing, it's nuts. Uh, yeah. But I love that, never stop learning, right? 
It's like right, constant absolutely. and never ending improvement. Uh, so what was your favorite part of that journey? Any certs or degree that you were like, this is what I was meant to do, or maybe this was eye opening or life changing in any way? So, you know, I didn't come from a super privileged background, but I also didn't come from a, from a want you know, I, I was, we were comfortable, I guess, and, and my family did well for themselves. And so I came up to this farm town and thought, oh, everybody has access to healthcare. Everybody's like me. They got a week long intro into diabetes. Oh, everybody knows exactly what they have to do. They have all the time in the world to come to their appointments. And I was dropped into the middle of this farm town and slowly, or not slowly, actually suddenly realized, no, there's so many barriers and there are so many things that hold us back or, you know, prevent us from doing what we want to be able to do. And there are people who don't have access to healthcare, or who don't even, you know, have it at all. And that was a shock. I just, I don't know. I, I didn't grow up sheltered, but in that, in those first few years working, I thought, wow, I've, I've been very naive um, and, and just didn't know, you know, that, that that was what was out there. But once I did realize that, that was the moment I said, well, this is, this is why I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to help people who need it the most or who don't have, you know, as much access as everybody else. Um, and I think that's what's been the most fun and the most rewarding uh, about doing it. It's taught me a lot. And, you know, as much as patients are grateful to me for what I do, I'm so grateful to them for allowing me to be a part of their lives and learn their stories and, and just, just kind of roll with it, I guess you could say. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds uh, like an amazing opportunity for you to not only serve that community, but also to, to find that role in your own life and to find that purpose. It's awesome. Uh, you mentioned something that kind of sparked a question in my head, which was, you know, not everybody has the same week long training that you had. And my question for you is what from that week long training could be useful to either our listeners or people who don't have access to that, maybe from a nutritional perspective that you know now of this overarching view of what's good, what type of food, uh, anything in that realm? You know, and it, I, okay, so it won't be exactly what was taught, rather what wasn't taught that maybe hmm. I wish would have been that I've learned, you know, through, through the years. I think there's such an emphasis when we first get diagnosed on carbs, right? Avoid mm -hmm. carbs or limit carbs and right. lower carbs. And yes, absolutely true. I'm not going to go against that. We have to be aware of that. But it was like every other food group on the plate didn't seem to matter anymore because all we were supposed to be concerned about was carbs. And so there's so many other, you know, and this has been through many years of learning, as you know, <laughs> but, um, you know, there are so many processes going on in our body, so many ways that as diabetics, we're kind of losing nutrients or not gaining uh, 100% of what we're putting in. And so I wish someone just would have said, hey, but also make sure that you have balanced meals, meaning all, you know, fruits, vegetables, protein, grains, make sure you have tons of fruits and veggies throughout the day. Yes, be mindful of fruits, but you know, get all those foods rich in nutrients and vitamins because your body kind of already has something stacked against it. So you need to help it as best you can. And, and you know, instead, the, you know, the conversation, no carbs, no carbs, no carbs. <laughs> and I just wish that we would take a more, you know, balanced and, and um, I'm going to say holistic. And I, I don't mean it in the sense of, you know, like hippy dippy medicine, but looking at the entire person, the entire picture that we're painting, not just focusing on their diabetes, not just focusing on our carbs, but on everything that's, that's important. I think that's a big opportunity miss when we talk to people and I get it, right? We can only talk to people for so long before they're zoning out and the information's so overwhelming, you know, that it's kind of not sinking in. But I just, I think that's an area of opportunity for us as educators in the field is to, to just remember every component um, as much as we can. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you mentioned a, a great word and that was overwhelm. And I think that if we, like, for example, you mentioned you and I, we both learned these things over years of living with type one of like, yes. oh wait, fats matter. Oh, proteins matter. What fiber right. counts? How do I count fiber? You know, right. it's all these different things that if they tried to cram that into a week, 
I would be overwhelmed. And it's especially right. in the beginning, right? right? And so finding that balance between making sure they get enough info, but also not overwhelming them to the point of, I don't even want to try because there's so many things to worry about, right. you know? And so I think that's where community comes into as a, as a huge bonus of people just kind of sharing their tips and tricks that they've learned through the years. Uh, you get to absorb that information at a slower pace, but it's more constant. Right. But yeah, it's a tough balance. It's a tough line to find where you don't want to overwhelm, but you want to give them the info they need to thrive with this. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I mean, there's not a perfect way to do it, but, um, you know, if ever I'm talking about it, I just always, at least a one sentence, like, don't forget about the other foods, you know, or something, <laughs> something to that effect, because people go home and they say, oh, well, the, the doctor, or the nutritionist or the diet, you know, whomever it was, oh, they told me I can't eat bread. They told me I can't eat rice. I can't eat this. I can't eat that. And it's like, no, that's not at all what I said. But you know, that, that's how we perceive it. And I, I've heard that story so many times. Um, and so to me, there's just, there's got to be a better way to get that message across, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Instead of restriction of you can't have pasta, you can't have bread. You know, we learned that there are strategies of mixing in fats right. and proteins, different pre boluses, where it's like, no, you can totally have it. Just don't eat right. a pound of pasta. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, like you said, pre bolus, I didn't even learn that pre bolusing was a thing until I got my insulin pump, which is probably mm. now I'm looking at three years. Um, and my best friend who is also a type one who used to work for the pump company, she's, you know, she, obviously she really understood the disease. She lived with it every day. Um, but she was the first person who ever told me that. And I thought, oh my gosh, how did I go? I mean, I'm coming up on 10 years. So how did I go seven mm. years without anybody ever once telling me that? Um, and so that's where I understand that component I kind of mentioned earlier about physicians just not knowing enough or little tips and tricks um, when they're meeting with people like us. Yeah, for sure. There's so many different strategies out there. Uh, and I think that's that might be part of the reason why, you know, the, the diabetic diet, quote unquote, has gotten so much popularity because it is so simple. It's like, oh, carbs are the devil. Good luck. <laughs> it's like step one, don't eat carbs. That's it. That's it. Uh, and so I wanted to pick your brain a little bit on the quote unquote diabetic diet. First of all, what does that even mean? And is it good? Is it bad? What are your thoughts on it? So historically it meant a diet low or limited in carbohydrate, not uh, to an extent of you had a certain number of grams of carbohydrates per meal that you were supposed to eat every day. Um, and we encouraged, um, or still do encourage whole grains, um, whole wheat bread, foods with lots of fiber to kind of, um, uh, cushion that, I guess you could say that digestion of the carbs. Um, and that was, that was really it, right? Just eat low in carbs. And I've actually done a lot of research writing the blogs that I've been writing for the program. And I wanted to see what the ADA, like, how did they, how do they define, um, a diabetic diet and they actually say that they're trending away from from using that which is hard right because we mm. need that that's kind of um not our identity but in a way it kind of defines <laughs> us and and how we eat and how we we build our meals um but they're trending away from eat low carbs and only eat you know a piece of string cheese or you know a piece of lunch meat when you're hungry or when your blood sugars are high um those older tips and tricks they used to offer they're actually trending away from um, and now they're just encouraging people and especially diabetics to eat well-rounded you know balanced meals half the plate fruits and veggies if you choose a grain or a carb making it a whole wheat or a whole grain carb um, and a lean protein um, which I like I actually really appreciate that they've they're making this transition um, and getting away from scaring us about carbs. Yeah, definitely. Um, what is the difference between whole grain? Why is it so beneficial? What's the, the secret sauce behind it? Or yeah. rather just avoiding refined items in general? Yes, sir. Um, well, so usually whole grains, the big draw or attraction to them is that they are jam packed full of fiber. 
um, and they're less processed, which are both really great things, um, not only for general nutrition, but for diabetics as well. Um, the fiber in those products, um, it in a way, it slows down the digestion of the actual carb that's in. It is part of the carb. Um, it's really hard to explain, but um, <laughs> it, 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 in a way, cushions and slows down the rate at which those carbs digest. In turn, for us, our blood sugars won't spike, you know, as drastically as like a piece of white bread that is uh, processed and completely lacking in that fiber. Yeah, plays a huge role in uh, the spike or lack thereof. <laughs> right. And it keeps your gut moving. I mean, as I get it that that's not necessarily a, a blood sugar thing, but going to the bathroom is always a good thing and a good way to keep somebody healthy. You know, we're at higher risk to get infections and, and not recover as quickly from infections. So getting any kind of junk and sending it on its way is, uh, is always a good thing in my book. Oh, for sure. And I think honestly, gut health is underrated. I think that it's starting to get more attention, but uh, I mean, I don't even know all of the benefits behind improving your gut health, but I do know that it's, there's a lot more studies coming out now. My wife's really into it. She's like, oh my gosh, we have to repair our gut, you know? Yes. I'm like, oh, it's super important apparently. Yes, it is very important. Um, I I won't make too many statements because I am too still learning about it. Um, but what I've actually learned in PA school, which I was so refreshed, um, re it was refreshing to, to hear about, was that uh, the gut kind of acts as its own separate um, nervous system in a way. And gut health is tied very closely to mental health. So those two nervous systems, I mean, not, not actually, that's what these these studies are trying to prove but that's the the theory behind is that it's kind of its own its own little nervous system and so they are mm. very well connected the foods that we tip like a standard american diet not good for our gut health um and so there's like a lot of theories as to how the way we eat impacts you know just our everyday mood and uh how we live and interact every day which i find super interesting yeah, and that's the uh, the gut mind connection I keep hearing about, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. So actually, um, our program because we're not currently in classes or on rotation, um, Yale University has a, a platform where they offer several courses that are free. Most are free hmm. um, and online. And so our school encouraged us to take like a well being course. Uh, but when I was kind of searching on there the other day, I found a gut health class as well. And I actually think I'm going to sign up and take it because this is oh, nice. the perfect time to do so. I have all the time in the world right now. <laughs> Why not? That's amazing. And you said they're all free too? Most of them. Yeah. Most of them are free. We're talking like psychiatry. There's like addiction medicine. A lot of it has to do with um, like uh, psychiatry and, and mm. psychological care. But even things like just learning about the brain and the nervous system and how neurons work. There's like a class on there uh, for that as well. So there's a lot of different options available. So I'm not Dang. promoting Yale. I, I'm not like sponsored by them. <laughs> there's, there's my little plug. That sounds incredible. Yeah. I'm all for, uh, you know, furthering learning, but for free too. That's amazing. For free. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think this is a fun, um, transition into you mentioned earlier the, the well-balanced plate how do you balance a yes. plate what does that look like sure so i think a lot of the times we think of my plate um there's also my i prefer um i think it's harvard's plate and so what that is is looking at your you know your circle plate i wish i would have had my little diagram <laughs> uh, <laughs> But you, you break it down into portions. So usually we divide it up into fourths. Um, and one fourth is vegetables. The other fourth is fruits. Um, I would actually prefer to just see that entire half of the plate vegetables, especially when we're talking about diabetes, because fruit can be a little bit tricky. Um, and I'm just a veggie-holic. So half the plate veggies. Um, and then look at that other half of your plate um, on the top half, a portion of lean protein that can be um, an animal protein. So like chicken and turkey meats are the leaner meats compared to like a steak or um, what am I thinking? Pork, you know, those are 
you know, meats that are a little fattier. Fish is another good lean meat to, to put up there. Um, and then the last uh, quarter of your plate should be dedicated to a grain. Um, as diabetics, we typically refer to those as carbs, but those words are almost interchangeable. Um, and so picking a whole grain like a brown rice or, um, I don't know, a piece of bread or um, throw in a sweet potato down there if you want to, just to make it a little bit more confusing. Um, but that, it's a good way. It's, it's kind of an easy way to figure out your portions and to kind of map out what you want to eat and, and um, the amounts of each type of group of food you want to eat. Mm. Yeah. And I love that you're including all the fruits and veggies too, that to, we shouldn't be afraid of them or the carbs. You know, if we choose the right types of carbs with fiber, it's not going to be as big of a hit as if we're going to be, uh, as for an extreme example, candy or something, right? If there's something super sugary, simple sugars, that's going to be a nightmare. Let's be real. Those right. carbs are the devil. <laughs> Unless Absolutely. you're treating a low, there's always yeah. a place for that. But or it's your like cheat day. But. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They'll have it, but not for every meal. But yeah, the fact that carbs are not the devil and um, they're okay. You know, it's okay they're if you want okay. to enjoy it, even if you think that you shouldn't be eating carbs. I hate diets that restrict things completely. You know what I mean? Like if you make a choice to restrict it, for example, if someone wants to be vegan, whether it's animal rights or they just don't like meat, totally fine if you want to restrict that. But if you're having an outside source tell you you can't have that, I'm not a fan of that. And, Mm -hmm. you know, someone says you can't have carbs or you can't have fats or whatever it is. I think that leads people down a path towards binging, honestly. I think that it's going to be very difficult to maintain that. Yes, you tell, I mean, what happens when you tell a little kid, no, they can't have something, they want it 10 times more, they go and they do it anyways. And um, I hate to break it to everybody, but we're all just really big kids. Um, And so if you tell, if you tell an adult, no, myself included, I'm just going to want it 10 times more and eat twice as much of it. Or, you know, let's say I go a whole day without eating carbs, or that's really extreme. But let's just say, well, Mm -hmm. You can guarantee on day two, I'm going to eat, you know, double, if not triple my carbs. I'm hungry. <laughs> my body, my body was used to eating, you know, not just because of like, the, yes, the mind plays a role in it, but my body is so dependent on that for its um, metabolism and the energy that I use every day to just do my daily living that it's going to need to compensate and make up for what I lost the day before. So, um, yeah, you, you, anything that limits a food group or tells you you can only have, you know, a juice or, you know, these juice cleanses or, you know, right. whatever it is, fill in the blank. Um, these are not the way to go. I don't, I highly uh, discourage those types of uh, eating patterns. Yeah. So from your perspective then, what is a diabetic friendly diet? Is there one specific way to go? Or are there multiple Uh, does it change because we're all unique? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I used to think, I used to think there was only one diet and then, um, and that was the low carb diet. And that, that just wasn't working for me personally, but it worked for other people. So I said, okay, well then it must, it must be the right diet if it's right for them. Um, and then I kind of mentioned in my video on Tuesday, I went hardcore extreme vegan. I had watched um what the health however many years oh ago yeah it came out. <laughs> and I remember I was working with kids and I went back and I was like oh my god I'm telling kids to drink milk I'm a whore you know I I, was, <laughs> I went a little off the deep end for a little while but I'll tell you my blood sugars were fan freaking tastic mm. um but it just wasn't it wasn't as uh satisfying and I don't know how else to explain it but I just wasn't full and I just didn't feel uh, energized or strong enough like I I had normally felt. Um, So now I've settled on a vegetarian diet, like I mentioned in my video. Um, But I still eat fish every now and then and I still incorporate um, meat and, you know, animal products. And so I'm I'm saying all this for a reason, I promise. Um, (laughs) I've come to the conclusion that every diet uh, that different diets work for, for each person. Everybody is unique. Everybody manages their diabetes a little bit different than the next person. And so because of that, each diet is a little bit different. 
granted things like ice cream and cookies and candy, like you were, you know, simple sugars, like you were mentioning. Yeah. That's like a, a universal diabetics probably shouldn't eat these most <laughs> of the time. Like that's a given. But when it comes down to food groups um, specifically or diets specifically, I think different things work for different people. Everybody exercises differently, you know, everybody drinks different amounts of liquids and waters and, and um, specialty drink, you know, you name it. And so it's, it's hard for me to just land on one diet that works the best for everybody. For me, it's for whatever reason, the vegetarian diet, but for others, it may not be. Um, and that's okay. You know, that's totally okay. Yeah, for sure. And we all have different reactions. Some people have allergies, some people have preferences, right? right? You know, so it's right. like, you can only eat this way. They're like, but point. I'm allergic. It's going to kill me. You're like too bad. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, there's like, I forget the statistic, but I know that like, I want to say it's what one in a hundred type ones who get diagnosed also get diagnosed with celiac disease. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of gluten-free people out there. Um, and not only are you telling them don't eat carbs, which isn't helpful because they're going to eat carbs, but then you're <laughs> not real, right? People don't get as much education uh, on gluten-free diets. So it's, I think it's really hard to just land on one for, for um, generalized nutrition. And that's the problem because everybody, and not you, but um, I get all the time, like people telling me, what, what should I follow? What should I do? And I always say, oh, you know what, what works best? for you and people roll their eyes at me when I say that because it's <laughs> not what they were hoping for right but that's I mean that's the God honest truth like it, you got to do what works for you yeah and I think the reason people get frustrated with that and you get some eye rolls is that they wanted the one specific answer and not have to put any extra work into it they don't want to have right. to go experiment and see how it feels and see how their blood sugars react because that's work let's be honest you know you have right. to document you have to look for patterns See if you yep. spike after meals. That takes time. So I get yes, it. It does. Uh, but that is how you're going to find what works best for you. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah, it, it takes work and um, a little bit of, you know, critical thinking, um, which, I mean, is hard. At the end of the day, I've worked all day. I've commuted in an hour from wherever I was at home or school or work, you know, and the last thing I want to do is write in my food blog or my food journal. I don't want to write down my numbers and my blood sugar log. So I, I get it. You know, it's, it's difficult, but like you said, it's really the only way to, to figure out what truly is the best diet for you. Yeah. Um, so I actually wanted to open it up for questions since we're streaming live in our uh, Warriors Tribe community. What's up, guys? Uh, for everybody on the podcast, while our tribe members are putting in their questions, um, I wanted to ask Taylor for a golden nugget. We like to wrap up these episodes with something that you want to share with the audience, whether it's something you learned over the years that was a little tip or trick or something that you educate on or that you're learning in PA school maybe that you would consider a golden nugget for the type one community. Okay. If I can, I want to share two. Do it. Um, yeah. Because I have one in my head and I get this all the time. Um, but when I tell people I have type one diabetes, whether they're strangers or patients or, you know, friends of the family, they give me the puppy dog eyes, like I said earlier, but then they always ask me, Oh, isn't that the worst kind? Or isn't that the mm. bad kind? And, um, this, this came to me only a few months ago. And so I'm trying to share it with everybody. I said, you know what the worst kind of diabetes is? It's uncontrolled diabetes. It doesn't mm. matter if you have type one or type two, because there are arguments for why one is worse over the other, you know, because I'm on insulin, that doesn't make me worse. I, you know, I always tell people I can dose to the hundredth of a unit to, to eat whatever the heck I want to. So to me, that's not worse. So I started telling people uncontrolled diabetes is the worst kind. And so it doesn't matter if you're on insulin or if you're on oral medications, if you're not taking care of yourself, that's when diabetes is a bad thing. Mm. Yes. So that's like my personal motto. I'm trying to share it with everybody. I love it. Um, but my second one, the one that I, I teach a lot and, and try to encourage type ones is feel free to experiment. Um, I, I'm coming up on my 10th year and it wasn't until I got my insulin pump three years ago that I learned it's okay to 
up my basal insulin, you know, a unit or two to see what that does. It's okay to alter my carb ratio a little bit, you know, don't, I'm not saying go from like a one to 16 ratio and cut that in half to a one to eight. <laughs> so those are extreme changes or, you know, your basal don't cut out five to eight units um, or, or up it five to eight units to see what it does. But if you want to up it one or two units every day, just to see what happens. And as long as you're going to track and do the work that comes along with that, feel free to do that. If you want to try to eat a different way or a different style, feel free to do that. Um, you know, we got some questions on the video from Tuesday about um, exercise, pre and post exercise snacks and, and how to avoid lows. And it's like, feel free to, to dose, feel free to not dose, feel free to try to, eat. I mean, as long as you have lows on hand, as long as you're being safe, of course, you know, don't go do these extreme things. But um, feel free to try new things because that's the only way you're going to figure out what works best for you or figure out a new change. Cause if you just keep doing the same thing, you may never get any better or any closer to that goal that you're, you know, you're hoping to achieve. Absolutely. I think you had a great piece of advice inside your advice, which was feel free to experiment, but only if you're willing to do the work, track it, yes. look for patterns, be safe, yes. right? You can't just make a huge shift and then just hopefully it works, right? Like you, <laughs> you got to right, document right. the blood sugars and see if there is a change that is good or bad. Right. If you're not and willing to, to put that work in, then it's then diff go, oh, go ahead. Right. I was going to say, don't make a huge change and then the next night go out and eat, you know, half a pizza. Right. Because those are just two conflicting, you know, ideas. So be mm -hmm. mindful of, of the changes you're making. And yeah, do the work, like you said, you know, track, 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 track. Absolutely. So guys, this is Taylor gone. Yeah, Gan. She's Gan. not gone yet. She will be gone <laughs> in a second. <laughs> uh, so for everybody listening, that was uh, an amazing chat about nutrition. Thank you, Taylor, for coming on today. Uh, everybody in our Warriors tribe, we're still going to be answering some questions for a bit. And I wanted to make a note for everybody listening on the podcast who is not yet part of the Warriors tribe. Warriors Tribe is our membership at FTF Warrior, and Taylor recently has joined the group as one of our assistant coaches. She's been doing lives. Taylor, what did we end up calling those? Or you? You came up with the, the creative name. Is it Tuesdays? Tuesdays with Taylor. Tuesdays with Taylor. I love it. <laughs> so uh, everybody in our membership now has Tuesdays with Taylor to talk nutrition. I go live once a week on Wednesdays to chat about everything else, and we are now implementing uh, once a month live podcasts like this one in the membership with experts every month. So tons of fun stuff going on, workouts, all the, the whole nine, right? And uh, I wanna invite everyone to jump on and uh, join this amazing community we've built up. So if you guys are interested in that, head over to thewarriorstribe.com. We'd love to have you join us and see you in our community, join the family. So that's it for our episode today. Taylor, hang on, we're gonna answer everybody's questions in the Warriors Tribe. Everybody else, have an amazing day. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast. Check out the other episodes because there's a bunch of good ones in there and keep up the fight. All righty, guys. We had a ton of fun recording that episode together for our Warriors Tribe, and I'm so glad that we got to share a piece of that with you. Now, of course, if you join the Warriors Tribe, you're not only getting access to the rest of that episode, the community, the workouts, the recipes, all of that greatness, but also all of the future episodes with our experts as well. So if you want to check out the Warriors Tribe, go to thewarriorstribe.com. Fill out your information, jump in, and we'll see you in there. Now, this membership only opens up once every three months for a short period of time, so I highly recommend jumping in at thewarriorstribe.com. Have an awesome day, and keep up the fight.